the music collided with my spirit in just the simplicity of running exercises up and down the piano. I found a weapon. Our creativity shines the best when we're under duress and we're creating out of our misery. I think that's mercy, and I think God allows us to find creative ventures in our mercy trying to survive out of traumatic experiences. This is Worship Is My Weapon with me, Rita Springer. Hey everybody, this is Rita Springer. Welcome to Worship Is My Weapon, part two of my testimony in this podcast series. I have been talking about just my um, early existence, how I kind of grew up in um, kind of a religious household, but a household that really did love the Lord, uh, suffering through the loss of my father and coming into just identifying loss and grief and um, trying to compartmentalize that in, in the religion and the nature of religion and learning um, the language of religion growing up and trying to eventually um, learn how to get out of the wilderness of religion into um, the beauty of relationship with Christ and working through uh, trauma that was really kind of I think spearheaded in, in all the work by worship and by learning the art of worship and finding the presence of the Lord. I talked a lot about um, the loss of my father and uh, kind of brought you in part one to the loss of my father and then uh, transferring just the need for a father onto my grandfather. And then my grandfather dies suddenly uh, a few months after my father died. And so I uh, have this fracture in my life of the, the loss of these two dads. And it was just shortly after that, that um, suffering as a family with that, again, six kids. Now my mom's a single mom. She goes to work as a church secretary in our Baptist church, our small Baptist church, um, in the small town that we lived at, about an hour and a half northeast of Los Angeles in the mountains. And um, my grandmother's now a uh, a uh, single woman living a couple hours um, in the San Bernardino area. And my mother is a single mother living by herself, kind of in the rural mountains, an hour and a half northeast of Los Angeles, goes to work as a church secretary. Uh, and we have to move out of this 350 acre house that we've kind of spent the last 10 years of our life kind of just um, as a playground. It was just an entire dreaming playground. And so my mother moves us into this. I remember the rent was $250 a month. It was a maybe 925 square foot rambler. that was actually a split modular, if you can believe it. And when I say that, it was a, a, a house that was kind of um, brought in on a truck, like a mobile home trailer would be brought in on a truck. And it was in two pieces. And so if you lifted up the carpet between the kitchen and the living room, you could see the split right down the middle of the house. And um, mom would always say, you know, she would, she would, there is tape underneath the carpet. And um, because the cold air in the winter would come up through that split that was never really fully put together correctly, I don't think. But we went from one impoverished existence to another impoverished existence, except it was a brand new modular in kind of a somewhat of a, a kid friendly neighborhood closer to our school at that point. And um, we would walk to the bus every morning and my mother would go off to work and she wouldn't get home until uh, 6, 6.30 at night after we were off the bus at 3.30. So a lot of the time we were just these latchkey kids that would come home from, from school. And, you know, at this point there's still four or five of us at the house and it's just it was mayhem. I'm just going to tell you it was mayhem. But we somehow kept the upright, old upright piano that when you walk through the front door of this tiny, tiny little house, it just stood right on the front wall in the living room. And I remember, um, you know, thinking, I don't think I'd ever want to play the piano, but I would love to perform on the piano. I um, had, you know, we went to church on Sunday at this Baptist church and um, the music pastor's wife played uh, the piano and the pastor's wife played the organ, I think it was. 
and or maybe that was opposite, but there were always these two ladies, one on one side of the room and one on the other side of the room when they played the organ. My um, introduction to worship uh, was really in that church. Um, I actually tattooed it on my arm because that church that I grew up in, I think, saved my life. And it was it was the the kind of church that did everything right by a widow. My mother was a widow, and she was an incredible church secretary, and she was an incredible human being. So they used to say that she counseled more people waiting to see the pastor in front of her desk than the pastor ever probably ever really counseled in the pastor's office. Um, and so she was just very highly loved by that church. We were in that church when my father passed away, but um, they had an affection and a love for my mother. She was very good at what she did. She was a very good typist and an administrator. And we were in this really good, solid Baptist church with a solid pastor. And we were brought into um, a Sunday morning service that just had the legit, you know, hymns um, on the wall when you walked in. And I remember in that church when we all of a sudden saw a booklet. It was a praise chorus book. I think it was by Maranatha. And it slid in next to the hymnal. And I remember thinking, huh, that's interesting. And instead of seeing um, hymn number 365 on the little hymn number thing, it would say chorus number 62 or page number 62. And I remember being in church on that Sunday morning. I was probably no more than 11 years old, 12 years old maybe. And we sang a chorus out of that book. And I remember the atmosphere flipping. I could feel something different hit me at the atmosphere. Now, of course, I'm too young to, I think, understand the fact that when you're singing about God, it's very different than the reverence of singing to God. But I have a, um, an affectionate love for hymns. And so I was, uh, I was a lover of, on a hill far away, sit an old rugged cross. I loved all those old hymns. But when you're going from that type of, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. When you're going to that kind of a song to, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, O oh Lord, it's, there was just an atmosphere switch. There was a complete atmosphere change. And I noticed it as a young girl, and I thought to myself, there's something in this that I, I need to remember. Like, I would just think, I need to remember this because it would, it hit that part of my life that had that fracture in it that was the loss of the dad. And it was almost like this door that opened up where I could feel the Lord wanting to get into. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't like closed off from the Lord. I wasn't closed off from the Holy Spirit. I was closed off to thinking I had any kind of, um, I think just I carried anything that God would want to be near me. Because, you know, I was the one that apparently I didn't pray hard enough and my father wasn't healed. So I wasn't carrying around my trauma or my grief as if God had caused it. I was carrying it around as if I had caused it and God couldn't do it because there was something wrong in me, which I think is, is part of the fracture where the enemy comes in and it's the crack in the windshield that he's like, yep, that's the truth. Yep, that's the truth. You're unworthy of God's attention. You're unworthy of how God comes. You're unworthy of ever having any kind of an audience with God. And God will never use you because you're just unworthy. And I bought into that lie. And so I think because I was buying into that lie, while I was feeling the presence of the Lord in church, I didn't know how to surrender myself to God because I was like, I'm just going to disappoint you, God. I'm just going to disappoint you. I'm just one big disappointment. And so the enemy will actually grab a hold of those things that become characteristics out of our trauma or out of our pain. And that's why I call them fractures. And he'll just keep shattering the windshield and bringing us into like these addictive behaviors. And part of my beginning stage of addictive behaviors was un unworth and, and um, low self-esteem. And so I would practice, obviously, in the mirror, um, literally before I went to school, you know, you're so ugly, you're so worthless, you know, you don't even deserve a dad. And so I would say these things to myself in the mirror on the way to school, like just before we'd head out of the bus. And there was this 
repetitive thing that I did because I thought, wow, okay, so this is just the mind of a kid working based on survival skills and her trauma. But I thought if God came for the dads and he's removed the dads, his ultimate thing is to actually remove the mother from the house. And if the mother's removed from my life, that's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. Like that's going to just tell me my unbearable unworth before the Lord. And so let's protect your heart by creating a boundary around your heart where you can't let your mother close to you. Because if you're, when your mother dies, she, it's just going to be horrible. So you can't create any kind of a, uh, a, a line to your mother. You're going to have to just put your hand up and make sure that your mother knows that she can't come any further. And my mother wasn't a really pursuing person. She would try her best to pursue me, but she could tell that there was just this resistance building in me. I was very much like my um, father and, and his mother. So I had a lot of passion, a lot of energy. I was probably more high energy than any of the rest of them and um, compliant, but resistant. And um, I think all of that worked in the favor of my creative nature, but I'm surviving now. So now I'm surviving on this palette of creativity because being creative is actually part of a survival skill. I talk a lot about this um, and I'll talk more about it in, in a series we'll do on in creative expression, but I don't, I don't think that, um, that we have to our creativity shines the best when we're under duress and we're creating out of our misery. I think that's mercy. And I think God allows us to find creative ventures in our mercy, trying to survive out of traumatic experiences. And so you will find people that are incredibly gifted and they are in, insanely wounded. And a lot of their um, energy that they put into their gifting kind of comes out of the sorrow or the grief of their um, state of trauma. And I think that that's mercy. I think that's the beauty of God saying, I've got to keep you alive this way. And I'm going to let creative expression be the way I keep you alive. I don't necessarily think that has to be how we find our art. Um, but for many people, uh, that is... Um, that is their survival skill, is finding something that keeps them busy, finding something that keeps their brain kind of going so that their brain's not on their grief or their trauma. And so absolutely for me, there were those things that I I wandered in dreamland. I was a big, big, big dreamer. I was going to be an actress. Remember, I was going to be an actress. So everything that I did, I was focused on acting, acting. So when we were able to move that piano in, my um, younger sister, our older sister, Roxanne, she was uh, 14 months older than me, so we lived in a room together our whole lives, extremely different from each other. But she asked my mother for piano lessons. And so here in the midst of the fractures, the trauma, the grief, trying to survive it all, um, being one that just like pretended it didn't exist and then was really creative and passionate in the process of it, going to church every Sunday, working in the church nursery, being wounded, not understanding how to deal with my wounds, but being a good girl, being a Christian girl, and doing everything right in church, feeling the musical surroundings in church, feeling worship changing in church by hymn to chorus, having all of these things surrounding me. And then my, my sister says to my grandmother, who has money to hire a piano teacher, I, I want to learn how to play the piano. And I was like, well, so do I, you, you know, my sister, I, this is just tragic on my behalf, but my sister Roxanne is just, she's a gold thread in the family and has a very beautiful, naive, wholly naive nature always has. I think she'll keep it till the day she goes home, but she was beautiful and she was thin and she was everything that I never thought I could be. I'm living in a room with this um, Marsha Brady type, and she's perfect in everything that she does. And um, if we both got the same dolls, which we both got the same dolls um, on holidays and Christmases, and I would destroy my doll within a matter of hours because I was so passionate about my doll. My doll's hair had to be washed. It had to be colored. Um, makeup had to be put on the doll. I was just that passionate, wild punk rocker kind of girl and my sister was the type of personality where she wouldn't take the net off the doll's hair. 
And so we were extremely different. So you can, you can imagine the sides of our rooms. Her room was very neat and tidy. My room was, looked like all hell had broken loose on that side of the room until I got organized and cleaned everything. But I was just a miserable wreck. She was just a neat and tidy girl. In fact, she had her desires for like birthdays and stuff was hope chest. Like she just wanted, that was a big deal back then. We, everybody wanted a hope chest. I could care less about having a hope chest and throwing stuff in that hope chest that I would remember. Like I lived vicariously through the day and everything was in the garbage can at the end of the day. It's like, I would just live day by day. And she was just very keepsake-ish. And so um, she had this hope chest at the end of her bed that had a key that she wore around her neck. So I was just driven to destroy everything in that hope chest or find out what her secrets were in that hope chest. And so you can just imagine when that girl says, I want piano lessons. And I'm thinking, I can't be that, but I will one-up you on, on any musical instrument. And that's the... The one and only reason I took piano lessons was because I was like, I am not letting Marsha Brady one up me on piano. I am going to outdo her in this and I'm going to be Liberace if I have to be. And so I took piano lessons to spite my sister, the sweetest sister in the whole wide world. And just so that I wouldn't have to feel less than in um, not being able to shine like she shined in so many other areas. And so now I'm in the piano lessons. We're going to piano lessons together, and it's brutal. Our piano teacher's name is Mrs. Roach. She was all of that. And I wasn't my sister. I was not a theory-loving, never-move-your-eyes-off-the-page, classically-trained piano genius. I was like, I want to play the theme from the soap opera, The Young and the Restless, back in the day. I want to play the theme from this romantic movie that was just out on. And so I would bring in the sheet music and I would be like, this is what I was going to play when my sister Roxanne was very, very um, fine to play Lavender Blue Dilly Dilly from the John Thompson's Red Book that we played in. And so I had to be dramatic about everything that I did because of course I was going to be an actress. And so piano lessons were horrifying to me and I took them for probably 10 years and I know, looking back on that, that was an act of God. So I am stuck with Mrs. Roach <laughs> playing these piano, taking these piano lessons, playing these recitals. And I remember, because I like to look at my hands, and well, that was just against all the rules and regulations with Mrs. Roach. You looked at the page, you never looked at your fingers. Um, and it was, it was brutal. She cut, she made me cut my nails till they bled. She wasn't a, she was an incredible teacher. She just was, she was hard nosed at it. And I had to wear this paper draping apron that went over my head that covered the keys so that I would be forced not to look. And you get someone who's passion driven and likes to color outside the lines and you try to put her in a box. And I just squirmed and I hated it. And then you take piano lessons that somebody's paying for and you have to you have to practice during the week because you'd have to show up the next week and you'd have to know what you were doing. I I'm so thankful for Mrs. Roach. I'm so thankful for those lessons because what they did for me was created a soft landing in the intensity of some of these fractures in my life that were these wounds that grief and loss had kind of allowed me to encounter. And they were these small lights almost blinking uh, on the way to get out of the wilderness. And so I remember being home alone. Now, my mom's at church till 6, 6.30 um, in her job. We come home around 3.30, 3.45. And those are the times you get your homework done, you do your practicing. Sometimes there was nobody else home or my sister would be taking a walk or a run and the boys wouldn't be home yet from sports or whatever. And I would sit down, and I remember being 11 or 12, and I was running Hannon um, up and down. Um, one of these exercises that she gave us, anybody that's a piano teacher knows what a Hannon exercise is, is. And I was running these exercises up and down and speed control and trying to gain speed control. Um, and I hit a chord. I can't for the life tell you what chord I hit. But I hit a chord, and I... 
I, I felt this supernatural thing come around me and I just started sobbing, just started weeping. It was almost like this porthole opened. And there was something beautiful about that chord that I hit, which to this day, it's kind of the thing that I talk about most in writing rooms because when I, when I come to the table with songs that I've been working on with, with other piano players, I'm told a lot like, man, the inversions that you use are the weirdest inversions, but they sound so cool. And I think it was just one of those things that I would find where that was the door or like this porthole that opened where the Lord snuck in. And I could feel his presence behind me, almost as if the Lord himself was standing behind me as I was sitting on that piano bench. And he just wrapped his arms around me and he almost just pulled me back. And it was this soft landing. It was just like this, all of a sudden it was this, can't even describe it, 12 years old, I can't really describe it, but it's this soft moment of just being like, all of a sudden I was feeling the loss of my father in a way that um, I hadn't felt in the, the couple years since his passing. And the depth of abandonment, the death of, of you know, um, you know the, the, what death brought on in abandonment, what death had brought on in just kind of like erasing a, a, part, of my, a part of my future that I would never get back. And I, I remember thinking some of those things like, and thinking, get out of this, get out of this, get out of this, like wake yourself back up, wake yourself back up. But what happened in that moment where the music collided with my spirit in just the simplicity of running exercises up and down the piano, I found a weapon. And I, I couldn't tell you it was a weapon at the time I found the weapon, but it became a weapon because the feeling was so strong for me that when I found myself alone in the house needing to practice, I would sit down at the piano and I would try to locate that chord as if everything had come in to that chord, which is kind of funny when I think about um, having like walked through revivals in the churches and being a part of certain revivals. Sometimes, you know, we see these phenomenons happen in revival and we try to replicate it. And it's like, what song were we singing? Where were we standing? What were we playing? You know, when did God swoop in the building? Let's re recreate that to see if God will come again. And I think it's what I was trying to do. I was trying to create the moment again and try to find the moment again of where I felt the presence, didn't know fully how to talk about the Holy Spirit at that time or the presence of God, accustomed with the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, just even when my father was alive and living in campgrounds and he would go around and grab campers and do like healing services with campers. I mean, it's just crazy the stuff he did. And I remember people getting healed in these circles as a, as a young, young girl. And so I remember feeling the presence of the Lord. And so I knew that familiar feeling, but not schooled in the articulation of how God comes or saying, oh, that was the Holy Spirit walking in here. But it introduced me again to the tenderness of God by way of, of a way out, almost like a flashlight. It's almost like, like music became a flashlight to get out of the wilderness. And so I would try to relocate where I was sitting, what I was doing. And that led into just random song rights by myself, alone in a house. No one was there after I practiced. And I, I started what I called just writing letters, musical letters. Sometimes I would take the bus from the high school or from the grade school over to my mom's, um, uh, my mom's work, and I would be dropped off there, and I would just go into the sanctuary of that little Baptist church that was lit during the day only by the stained glass windows along the side. And it, there was a stained glass window right in front of the grand piano that would sit there. And I didn't need the lights on. I just, I just was the afternoon daylight as the sun was kind of going down. And my mom was still up the hallway in the office working. And I would sit down at the piano and I would write letters to the Lord. I would just, I would just find these inversions in these chords and I would write letters to the Lord. You could have come up to me and, and said, oh, you're worshiping. And I'd be like, what? Like I had no... There was not a manual. Um, in fact, I was asked the question the other day, you know, um, the difference between the way that I grew up understanding worship and what worship is in our churches. And when I say worship, 
as I'm speaking right now, I'm talking about the worship of what we call music in the church right now. To me, worship is relationship with Jesus, but you know, understanding it from from the basis of of musicianship and what we do in church on Sunday morning as we worship God with music and bring in the presence of the Lord. Those were very different. Uh, they have very different meanings back then than to today. And I was asked that question, like, what do you think is the problem in today's generation uh, from where you learned it and where they're learning it? And the only way I can explain it is what I had back then was the organic quality of walking into like a, a Whole Foods or a Sprouts where everything's just like picked off the vine and everything's organically raised and you're buying the real authentic thing right there, as opposed to what I think now worship is a manufactured packaged deal where you walk in and you just kind of pull the box off the shelf. I think we've raised a whole generation to understand worship as a performance or understand worship as a commodity, as opposed to understanding worship as an actual weapon that we use. Now, that's taught and and people understand that in the different genres of who's leading and how they're leading and what songs they're singing. But um, our performance as worship leaders, we're, we're not back in those days anymore. We're kind of in a, in a different cultured environment where it's really about how cool it sounds or how, um, how uh, we can do all these things to it as opposed to the organic quality of how it was first done. This is before you know, it was marketed. This is before worship was four chords. This is be, this is in the beginning stages of of how Maranatha Integrity and Vineyard kind of came into being with those things, and being raised in that and being kind of introduced into that environment. I I wouldn't go back and change my my heritage to save my soul, because I kept all of the authenticity of those things, and I'm so glad that it was during that era of finding the little chorus book sitting next to the hymn and, and trying to find the balance between two of those and understanding the difference between what was being, um, what, what was being said in the atmosphere from the perspective of I'm singing about God to singing straight to the Lord and the, the changing in that. And I was taking piano lessons underneath the realm of that tutorialship to that, you know, being tutored by those things and, and then sitting down and then just writing these like, random songs that I'm sure God just was like gushing over. Like maybe, maybe when I'm in eternity someday, God will roll back the film and be like, this one killed me. Like this one killed me. And I would love to see that because it's the innocence of that, the innocence and the wonder of finding something you're not knowing what you're finding. You have no idea how to articulate what you're doing, but you're doing something so organic in the process and, and that, that, you know, in 30 to 40 years, you're going to look back on that and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, it was gold. What I was finding, I was mining for gold and I didn't even know I was mining for gold. And I'm so grateful for that. I look back on that and I'm like, I wish that I, if I could spoon feed every worship leader, um, something valuable, that's what I would spoon feed them is like, man, if you, if you can understand worship from the essence of what it is in the organic state of its authority and its authenticity, you will go far in, in the longevity of what you have to give the Lord if you keep the attributes of those first encounters. And I, and I had those first encounters. And, and not being able to articulate it, I think for me, is precious when I look back on it because the innocence of it is just staggering. But I still, I still can feel the just the beauty of his presence. Like, I mean, I didn't have to do anything. I just had to put my hands on the keys and he would come rushing in almost like he couldn't wait to be with me. And he couldn't wait to hear this silly little song with, you know, probably back then bad inversions where I just was finally able to say, Hey, this hurts. Um, I don't know how to process this. I'm, I know I'm struggling with this. I'm hearing these things. I don't think it's real. And I was hearing things at the, you know, at the time, you know, co coming into my teenage years and really struggling with self-worth, struggling with just like low self-esteem. And, you know, I struggled with my weight as a kid and that was always really, really hard. Um, when kind of the rest of my family didn't struggle with that and trying to, um, keep my head in a place where 
when I organized, I organized. And I think I kept an addiction in organization because organization actually, I could, I could look, I could do something, I could step back, I could look at it, I say, hey, look, I'm not that screwed up. Look, everything's in a place. Look, everything's color coordinated. Look, everything. So where I lived in this passionate, one side of my room looked like a mess, dead movie stars taped to the wall, you know, my acting world so so out of control. But then there'd be these bouts of these, these you know, controlling kind of addictive natures that I would have. And I remember coming into high school, 15, 16, I met this kid, this young girl, and she she just sat down with me and she's like, hey, do you have... you?" you want to lose weight. And I was like, of course I want to lose weight. And she's like, I can teach you how to lose weight. And she led me into the process of what would later become severe bulimic. I, I was just a severe bulimic. And which that opened a door to the addictive nature of self-harm. And I was at church every Sunday. I was volunteering in the nursery. I was in the youth group. I was all of the things I needed to be, but I was just wretched on the inside. And I think looking back on it and seeing the, the battle between what the Lord was trying to get me to flip on a light and say, hey, here's the light out of this tunnel. The enemy was like, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. You got to stay in this tunnel. You got And so, you know, when, when hell hears a rumor of what heaven's saying about you, and you're not willing to believe what heaven's saying about you, you will lean on the side of what hell is saying. And so if, if hell is saying you're unworthy, yeah, all those things, yeah, whatever, whatever, but you're unworthy. You're never going to amount to anything because your father's dead. You're never going to amount to anything because you're not worthy to have a father. Why would God ever want to be your father if you're not worthy to have a father? You know your mother's going. You know if you remotely even try to get close to your mother, your mother's going to go too. And so I started this ritual as a kid where I would get up, I would wake myself up at two or three o'clock in the morning and I would crawl on my hands and knees to my mother's bedroom and I'd lay myself out on her bed, on her floor, the floor of her bedroom and I'd just listen to her breathe. I would just lay there listening to her breathe. You know, parents breathe really weird anyway when you're a kid and so I would just listen to her breathe and I realized I was just waiting for her to die. There's something in me that I was like, I have to, I have to, be there when my mother passes away. I have to be there when she, so that I can finally have this thing over my life that says, see, everything, everything that you knew would happen, it's happened. And this is proving to you that you are not worthy. God will never be around you. And so the forces of the good and the evil in my life where God is trying to get me to see that I have something to offer, the enemy comes in and says, hey, why don't we um, why don't we look to how you don't look the way you should look, how you really are unworthy. It's in your physical nature. It's in your physical being. Let's start an addiction that creates chaos. And so while I'm saved and, and trying so hard to be the good girl, now I'm vomiting, you know, seven to 14 times a day, everything that I ate, lost at that point 60 pounds in six weeks. I'm malnourished. And my mother doesn't really know it, and she kind of is suspecting, but we're talking, we're talking the 80s. We're talking the late 70s, early 80s. And there was nobody in, in the public that was talking about this kind of addiction, um, except for Karen Carpenter. And uh, when that came out in the news, I think that, that my mother was like, I think there's something going on. I mean, I created in my addiction, and this is the thing about addiction that I just want to really state because those of you that have struggled with addictions are going to understand what I'm saying. In every kind of addiction, this is how it goes down. We only create an addiction to give us a sense of control to things in our life that feel out of control. So we create an addiction because we're trying to gain some sense of control in areas where we just feel like we have, we have no grounding. And when we choose an addiction, what we're not really fully prepared for is the addiction itself creates even more out of control behavior. But because it, it gives us a power in the moment of its addiction, whether it's a drug high, that drug high for the first whatever makes you feel like everything is going to be okay, makes you feel like you're back in control, only to lend itself to the need for more and more and more to make you further out of control. And then you're a drug addict, blah, 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 blah. Addiction is addiction. 
It, it always works. However, if it's an addiction to bad language, addiction to pornography, addiction to television, addiction to romantic novels, addiction to whatever your food, addiction to whatever you're addicted to, it has the same, it's, it has, has the same outcome, outcome. And so for me to create an addiction to bulimia, I was creating addiction to a bulimic or dieting disorder to actually make myself feel better about myself because I hated myself and I hated my physical appearance. And everybody else was probably not okay with my physical appearance. And I knew that because the minute you lose 60 pounds in six weeks and you go to church or you go to school, the first thing that said is, wow, you look great. Because society is conditioned on standing in supermarket checkout counters, looking at the face of magazines saying, that's what we're supposed to look like. And so it's been there from the history of time, most likely. So or, or something has told us that. And so um, you're not going to find anybody in the church at that point in my life saying something's wrong here. It's just you look great because now I look like you want me to look and I look like I probably should have always looked, but I'm doing it in a way that has formed an addiction that now you got to feed the addiction. And so I let myself to another portal of, of this portal being almost like this this door of the demonic that came in where I was actually hearing demons tell me that um, if I kept that apple down, that the apple was going to come. In fact, I would see demons manifest like food in front of me as a teenager. And it would tell me, I'm going to kill you if you don't throw me up. So I can't tell anybody what's happening. And the only out source that I have, the only resource of anything that I have to shut the voices up that I find is if I run to the piano and I play and I sing those bad inversion songs to the Lord, the enemy shuts his mouth. That, that thing dissipates and goes away. Can't tell you that I understood it as a weapon at that point, but I can tell you that God was allowing me to find a source where I knew if I just I can get it to shut up if I go to the piano. I can get it to shut up if I go to the piano. And so I had that ritual and I had that, um, I had that, that resource to go to without an understanding of how to like put all the pieces of the puzzle together and I'm raging out of control. And so if you're not going to get an addiction out of control, the addiction allows itself to another addiction. And so the other thought process of that was harming yourself. I would take razor blades and I would hear these demonic voices saying, cut yourself. So I would take razor blades to my wrist. Anybody that's in self-harm or struggle with self-harm, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe you're a parent of a self-harmer. Um, in our heads, what's actually being said is we have to actually give ourselves some kind of manifestation of our unworth. And so we're cutting our wrists saying, you know, not deep cuts, just like, just these little slices that say you're worthy, you're ugly, you're you're unworth, you're 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 useless, and I would repeat after the voices, I'm ugly, I'm worthless, I'm I'm useless, I'm ugly, I'm worthless, I'm useless, and then I would wear long sleeves because heaven forbid you can't handle the shame of it all, because that's the the end result of addiction is the enemy spirals you into shame, and then you're further away from the Lord because of the shame, and it's just this whole thing that the enemy loves, and that's why he feeds on it all the time. How do you get rid of that? Well, when it's become an addiction, it only leads to one thing. And for me, it was suicide. I had a youth pastor I loved at that little Baptist church. And I trusted that youth pastor. Um, he was a funny guy. Uh, he made sense when he talked. Um, and I felt like I could trust him. And I remember I went to him uh, one afternoon when I took the bus to the church waiting for my mother. And I went in and I just sat in a chair in his office. And I said, can I talk to you about a friend of mine? I was talking about myself, but I was, you know, I was undercover talking about myself. I said, I have this friend at school and she wants to kill herself. She doesn't think she's worthy. She wants to kill herself. But she's saved and she wants to know if she kills herself, is she going to go to heaven? And... He just looked at me and he's like, are you sure she's saved? And I'm like, absolutely. I know she's saved. I know she's asked Jesus in her heart. Um, and, and I just, uh, she struggles with that. And I didn't know what to say to her. And he looked at me and I remember 
He nodded his head up and down, and he looked at me square in the face, and he said, yeah, she kills herself. I think she'll go to heaven. And when he said it, I remember swallowing really hard and thinking, that was way too easy. Like, that was way too easy. And inside I'm screaming, no, like, no, don't, don't, don't tell me that. Like, don't tell me that. Like, like I'm hanging on a, on a, on a ledge here. Like, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. And I remember I, I got up and I was like, okay, thank you. And I, and I walked out. He never said anything else. And he just acted very kind of odd um, in the process of, of that conversation. But I kind of just was like, I think he's just giving me license to kill myself. I think this pastor is giving me license to kill myself. And everything saved me. Every bone in my body that had Jesus wrapped around it was just like, stop this road you're down. Like, stop walking on this road you're, you're on. And I'm 16 years old at that point. And I did the dirty deed. I, I filled my palm with every prescription in our medicine cabinet. I don't know if I, if I took enough pills at that point to actually kill myself, but I took enough pills that night that my stomach, I should have been rushed to the ER and my stomach should have been pumped. And I remember I swallowed those pills and after I swallowed the pills, this, this absolute shame came over me. And I laid in my bed and I said to the Lord, I am so sorry I am who I am. I'm so sorry I'm such a biggest disappointment. And I just waited to die. I just laid in that bed and I waited to die. And all of a sudden, I felt this presence in the room. And I heard this voice very profoundly say to me, and I knew it was the Lord. It just said, Rita, you were five years old when you gave your life to me. So I tell you when it's over. And I went to sleep. And I woke up to the alarm that I had always set for school the next morning. Absolutely no side effects, no druggy feelings, absolutely 100% as normal as I woke up every other morning. And it was the first time that I was like, I think the Lord just saved my life. I didn't tell anybody about it. I removed the suicide letter off the, off the, um, the desk in between my sister and I because I didn't want her to see what I had tried to do. And I silently got up and got ready for school and was shook that God had just entered my life in a way that I knew I was going to have to pay attention to it. I'm going to like close us here to just the final kind of part of my testimony in um, how God took me through high school and ended up giving me, um, putting me on an on a independent record label and launching the first song that I ever wrote that went all around the world that had no intentions to go all around the world. But I, I, I believe that none of that would have ever happened had I not had the encounters that I had, the mercy of God, and the fact that I, even in my trauma and my pain, still allowed the Lord to have a say-so in my life. I still allowed the Lord to be a father even though I didn't know how to let him be a father. I still let him be a voice even though I didn't know how to let him be a voice. And he was working secretly in areas that I really didn't understand how deeply he was working, but he was working. And if we allow him the chance to continue working, he will show us, even as adults, dealing with stuff that we've perhaps, maybe you've never dealt with those things. When you look back on your life, if you look in pinpoints of your life and ask the Lord to show you, he can show you where he began to create a weapon for you to stand against the enemy with. Um, that's my hope for you. That's my hope for you in this particular series of, of personal testimony and how I even got to the place to have a platform to say anything um, about the Lord. 